Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. Today's episode is your post Wimbledon mailbag. That's right, I am blending Monday Match Analysis and the mailbag, my two separate content structures. I uh, had to be done. I planned on doing the mailbag earlier than this, but I got ridiculously busy. Couldn't find a moment. Now it's Monday. So guess what? This is Monday Match Analysis. This is also a mailbag. I posted in the YouTube community tab several days ago, so you had plenty of time to get your comments in. I picked 29 of them. I'm going to try to be in the 45-minute range, so I probably won't get to all of the comments that I picked out. Uh, but I am really excited to get into it. Great comments. Interesting time in tennis at the moment. Let's do it. First one is from Bloat123. Gil, thoughts on team's recent matches in Bostad. His forehand seems vastly improved, and he has beaten two solid players. The backhand's potency seems to have mostly returned as well. How does this bode for his comeback in the upcoming U.S. Open series? Murray seems to be in good form, too, and is on track for a seeding at the U.S. Open, which may finally help him make a deeper run for once. Thanks. I want to mostly answer to team here. I think that I think team is the reason why this was. I'm pretty sure the top liked comment. Team beat Emil Rusevori and Roberto Batista Gut in Bostad. That is astronomically better than any of the results he has been able to produce in 2022. In fact, Rusevori is the highest ranked opponent he's faced all year long. In 2022, before Bostad, team was 0 for 6 tour level and had won just one set, and that was in his first match back. And the draws weren't bad. He was getting totally pretty favorable draws and still losing in straight sets. So it was uh, it was hard to watch and really surprising for me. You know, I I didn't think it would be this hard, but I think a couple things happened. I think either there was fear of re-injury of the wrist, and that was basically destroying his forehand. Or there was were mobility and strength issues in the wrist that were not enabling to hit his forehand as strong as he needs to. I actually think it's probably the latter, because I think with all of the rehabilitation and the preparation that he would have probably gone through in order to be ready to return to the court, I would guess that there was really no problems with the wrist at that point. Now, sometimes you can have a surgery and a limb or, or ligaments or joints, whatever it be, never comes back the same. And maybe that's the case with team, hopefully not. It's a possibility. But I I tend to think that there was a, a fear of actually swinging as fast and as hard as he needs to swing in order to produce his best forehands. And it was definitely an, an eye-opener when it comes to just how important team's forehand is to what he does on the court and how, how big a role the forehand plays in making him a great player. I already knew that, but to this extent, was pretty incredible to see. There are other things that have certainly gotten better throughout his comeback. Absolutely, the fitness is better. Uh, the decision-making has gotten better. I actually think that that was what clicked. Besides the forehand becoming damaging again, which I don't know that that happened for the first time this week, but to, to marry the damage and the consistency of the forehand together, it felt like this was the first time that happened. But then, not only that, I think he started trusting his legs enough to do a lot of running and to get the shot selection back to where it needs to be in order to be consistent. And the backhand has been really good the whole time. I know in this comment, it was said that the backhand potency has returned. I, I thought that was there the whole time. I didn't really like what I saw out of Team's serve. I didn't think his first serve was as good as it, it needs to be. So that might be one of the things that Team is alluding to when he talks about the things that he still needs to get better. But ultimately, this was a huge relief, if you're a fan of Dominic Team to see him put together these victories. And it's a big positive going into the North American hardcourt. Uh, there's a long way to go. I um, 
I wouldn't be surprised if team ends up somewhere in between reaching where he was at one point, really in 2020, was his peak. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he winds up somewhere between the 2020 team and the worst case scenario team that really never becomes a top player again. I, uh, that's where I would stand right now. So uh, it, was, it was good to see. Next one is from Andrej. Hey, Gil, Sviantek was the talk of the town for months, hailed as the future. She didn't get very deep into the tournament. Might go as far as saying she had a pretty bad tournament. Is she a clay specialist? What are you expecting from her at the next two hardcore slams? I'm struggling to reconcile the fact that she's so well regarded, yet before the tournament, countless pundits were claiming that many other players could beat her. How can expectations be so low on grass? Is versatility not a prerequisite for greatness? Thanks. The way we have to think about grass, Joel Drucker, my co-host on three, he wrote a great piece about the whole clay court specialist term and how it really applies much more to grass because hard courts and clay courts, at especially at the modern game, have way more in common with each other than grass courts and hard courts do. So, and, and then when it comes to spot in the calendar, also grass is so niche. If we're talking about specialization, grass is the specialization here. Grass is the surface where you can have great players looking ordinary because they just don't quite know how to move or they're not confident and they feel uncomfortable and which Fiontech, it seemed very mental what happened to her against uh, Cornet. And it, it just felt like she was completely out of her element. So it's, it's way too harsh, way too harsh to really come down on her for losing at Wimbledon. Because there's just not a lot of grass play there. I mean, it, it certainly wasn't a priority. I mean, at a certain point, once you've won a couple of Roland Garros's and hardcore, I mean, she just won her second major. So maybe once she has a bunch of slams under her belt and she actually puts her mind to improving her grass court tennis and that becomes a priority, uh, then maybe you could say, well, Iga should probably figure this out. But we are not at that point yet. Hello, Gil. Thank you for your great work and keep it up. This is from Jack. I appreciate it. I'm wondering if you have an opinion on the camera angle that the broadcasts use. I believe a court level view would give viewers a fuller appreciation of pace, depth, weight, height, etc. of shots, as well as the overall physicality. It also makes baseline half volleys look unbelievably amazing. The only upside to the usual angle, in my opinion, is that you can clearly see whether the ball is going in or out. I believe the court level view would draw more new viewers, but broadcasts still use the default. Do you have any knowledge of behind the scenes discussions on this topic, whether it's being discussed or not, and if there's a glaring reason why it hasn't been implemented? Sinner versus Alcaraz at the Paris Masters is a decent example of the angle I'd like to see more. Highlights are on YouTube. This just frustrates me because it seems like a no-brainer to me. Couple things on this. First of all, way to my heart. Talk about tennis on TV. Bring me your takes on tennis on TV. That's that's how to get in the mailbag, if we're being honest. There's a lot of layers to this. A couple uh, months, years, I don't know. Uh, a little while back, I did put out a Twitter poll about the low camera angle versus the high camera angle and what viewers preferred. And I expected most viewers to say that they prefer the court level view of tennis. I was surprised to see many, many viewers prefer the overhead angle. And the reason for that is very simple. While what you described is true, the visceral power, the spin, the height, the depth, the physicality, the speed, all that, it is, uh, it comes across more the low when the camera is lowered next to the court and closer, by the way, don't forget closer, lower and closer. 
that comes across better. What you lose is the other side of the court. You cannot see the other player very clearly. And uh, you lose a lot of that big picture of the information of how a point is being constructed because you're you're losing a lot of data on where the ball is bouncing on the other side of the court. So I do believe a few things are going on here. First of all, I think there's a Goldilocks. There is a just right. Not too high, not too low. Because we all know when cameras are too high. It is unbearable. It is disgusting. It is a huge turnoff. There is a Masters 1000 where the camera is too high. Paris Bercy, it's too high. Court looks terrible. Tournament doesn't look good. It's hugely annoying. Newport last week. Camera was too far away. Just It just was. So, this happens. It's bad. However, if a very, very low camera was used, which it is oftentimes, if you go to challenger streams, college tennis streams, where there are not a lot of stands behind the baseline, and then you have that low kind of court angle, uh, court level angle, you tire of it. I think part of the reason why it's so refreshing to see the lower angle, and it's such a fun experience to get that lower angle, is because we don't get it a lot, there is a novelty to it. But if you got it for three hours, you would probably get sick of it. I believe that to be true. I could be wrong. There is a level of subjectivity to it. But in general, uh, Wimbledon, for example, that's a great camera angle. There has to be a middle ground. But tennis is the only sport where, because all of the stadiums are so, so different, there seems to be this massive amount of variance. And you know what? This is an example of if I were running the ATP, I would put my foot down. I would enforce, when I'm selling these licenses for tournaments, I would put harsh regulations on the camera angles because it is unacceptable that there are certain tournaments that have that have completely unfriendly to the viewer camera angles on their center courts. It is just unacceptable if you want to take yourself seriously as a sport. Next one from Sam Collins. Gil, hypothetical here. What do you think the big three would be accomplishing if they were in their late teens, early 20s now? Do you think they'd be on the same track of domination in this era, already racking up slams? I would say this about Rod Laver. I would say this about Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi. I would say this about Roy Emerson. The great players have a thing about them that um, that makes them great far beyond the things that we talk about in the framework of the era that they play in. For example, you talk about Sampras's serve and volley, or serve and volley, right? The dumbest argument of all time is: Would Pete do well now with his serve and volley? Guess what? If he grew up. If he was born in 1995, he would have not, he wouldn't have become a servant volleyer. Isn't this obvious? Right? But all of the things that made Pete Sampras great in development, the work ethic he had, the character he had, the circumstances he had, the people he put around him, the competitor that he was, the student of the game that he was the natural hand-eye coordination he had, the natural athleticism he had. Whatever he decided to do, whatever era he came up in, and however that era shaped his game, he would have been great. So my answer to this question is this. Would the big three have been great if they were born, if they were in their teens right now? Yes. Would they be the same? No, they'd be completely different players because this game moves forward. This game does not stay in one place. But all these great players, they are they are way more than than what we what we box them into in terms of the era that they are in. 
They're way more than that. They are, uh, they're just great tennis players. It, it, it wouldn't matter what era uh, they played in because they would just be different players and they would adapt. Hi, Gil. Two questions from Racket Talk. Uh, thanks for being a member. Nick Kyrgios obviously had the best couple weeks of his tennis career at Wimbledon, reaching the final and pushing Djokovic as far as he did. We know the weapons he has, the precise serving, the backhand return cross court, the volleys sometimes, but we also got a glimpse of the things he struggles to do well, such as do more damage with his forehand from a neutral position, getting jammed on the forehand return, locking down mentally on big points. If you could coach Nick, what would be the top three things you would work on with him? Do you think he struggles with these things because his footwork is not sharp slash efficient enough to get him in the right position for the ball? Or do you think it has more to do with his stroke mechanics? Ooh, well, first of all, going with the if you could coach Nick is a tough way to start the question, considering nobody can coach Nick. He's not interested in coaching. Uh, but I understand the functionality of this question. It's an interesting one. It's one I haven't thought about that much. But, I mean, the first thing that I would talk with Nick about is um, how he plays every point. You know, I would try to get him to focus on every single point. That would be the first thing. In terms of the other weaknesses, I mean, using his legs, I think, would be, and, and then, you know, flattening the ball, the forehand out. And I think those two things go hand in hand. Um, and yeah, getting his feet in, in the right position, you know, working on the footwork because the footwork is definitely a, a huge part of it. But I don't know. Like, I don't love thinking about that kind of thing with Nick because it feels so far-fetched that, you know, there these things... Like, at, at a certain point, most of Nick is who he is. And the whole notion that Nick is, like, wasted potential... I think is total bogus. Uh, Nick Nick is who he is. You know, he's not trying to... He's never really had any chance to, to be better in some of these areas. Now, like... Like... Are we really going to sit here and be like, what if Nick played every point like David Ferrer? Like, Nick's just not that guy. How is that any different from saying... What if Ferrer's forehand was as big? What if Ferrer served as big as Berrettini? I don't see how that's different. I really don't. You know, Nick Nick is who he is, but when a player is is working on something technically and they have, you know, big issues at, with decision making and stuff and they it it feels like they could get better, that's where I'm like if I'm a coach, there's things that I could um think okay, uh, this person should work on a different return position. This person should try to develop their slice. This person needs to work on their transition game. Uh, this person could really add a drop shot. Nick kind of has every shot. He has everything there. He plays in a way that pretty much I think he is going to play. I don't think he plays the wrong way for his skill set. There's not that much. I, I kind of feel like Nick is Nick at this point. I don't know if a coach could do jack to help Nick Kyrgios right now. Jack. Seriously. There's a reason he doesn't have a coach. Because a coach can't help him. None of, the, none of the issues with Nick Kyrgios as a player, no coach is fixing that. No coach. That's why he doesn't have one. On Daniil Medvedev, he has, an interest, he has had an interesting season. On one hand, he was within spitting distance of winning the Australian Open title. But on, but on the other hand, he has not won a title this year. And although he played well in some grass events before Wimbledon, he has 0-7 in finals since the U.S. Open last year. Traditionally, we now enter a period of the season where he has statistically been the best player in the world for the last three years. That is true. My question is, what are your expectations for him now to the end of the season? Do you have questions about his mental toughness right now? And how much do you expect to see him improve on some of his weaknesses, such as finishing better from the back, front court tennis, volleys, etc.? I, do n I'm, I don't think he's going to improve much in those areas. I'll tell you why. Finishing from the back of the court with his forehand, I think there are physical limitations. Uh, front court tennis, the technique is not good. The technique does not look like 
the kind of technique that is going to uh, lend itself to being great in the front court. And unless there's drastic changes in, in said technique, which I don't anticipate happening, I don't think Medvedev is ever going to be a wizard up there or consistent up there. So uh, both of those things I don't see improving. No. However, as you said, Daniil Medvedev as Daniil Medvedev, who, by the way, he's 26 years old. So he's kind of past the point of rapid development. Now it's about small details. Now it's about maximizing what he has. I don't think he has in him any kind of really uh, drastic change in, in how he plays. Uh, just because a lot of the things he do he does is is so unique that I would I really do struggle to see him making any massive new developments in his game other than maybe adding some things to his return game, which I think he must add and I think he will at some point. Um, my expectations are really high though, because that's what his previous results have suggested our expectations should be. So. Um, I expect him to bounce back, but I'm concerned about the finals thing. I'm definitely concerned about that. That could weigh on him next time he's in a final. We we see how, you know, we've seen with many players how that can start to compound and the pressure can can get worse and worse and worse in between him being number one, not having a lot of confidence and momentum and losing a lot of finals. Uh, I am concerned about that 0 for 7 in finals. I'm concerned for next time he gets in a final, and I think that could be a factor. But once he gets over that hump, we know what he can do, and he should be able to continue to do that. Here's one from Steven. Hi, Gil. Djokovic did so well to come back and dominate in the final three sets of his last four matches at Wimbledon. He seemed to lack that fight against Nadal at Roland Garros. I don't understand... With that match on the line, why he would just fizzle out like that in the fourth set against Nadal. He didn't seem willing to fight until the end in that match like he usually does. Thanks. The only thing I'll point out, because I don't want to cover again the my observations of those two matches. Uh, what I want to point out here is there is a major fundamental psychological difference between trying to come back against Nadal and trying to come back against uh, Nori, Sinner, and Kyrgios. And that is the following. Novak knows if he plays his best, the three opponent, opponents who he beat at Wimbledon, they just can't touch him. They, they can't. So all Novak needs to do is get to his level, get to his 10 out of 10. And he knows in his heart of heart, he knows deeply that they can't beat him. Like, like deeply he knows that. And it's true. They can't. Like if Novak is his best... They can't do anything about it. And to have that in the back of your mind, to know that, is uh, is a huge psychological advantage that nobody can, you know, everybody, every player would love to have, but they can't have it because they're just, they're not Novak Djokovic. Nadal is a completely different animal on clay because Rafa, with Rafa, there's doubt. There's no guarantee. You can play great Novak knows he can do, he can be great and he can lose to Nadal. He can be his best and he can lose to Nadal. So it's a completely different feeling trying to come back. Um, knowing that you might not be good enough. You, you might not be good enough versus I know I'm good enough. I just need to figure myself out. I just need to get it together, play my best tennis, and I got this. So it's a totally different uh, dynamic mentally. From Elwin Dingo, thanks for being a member. Uh, what was going to be your prediction on Kyrgios Nadal? Look, I have broken down the last uh, the last couple of Nadal Kyrgios matches, Wimbledon, Australian Open. I have seen so many uh, fantastic patterns that Nadal has used against Kyrgios with success repeatedly. Uh, Nick has really struggled to return serve against Rafa. The lefty thing is a huge advantage for Nadal in many respects, and the way Rafa was hitting his forehand. Um, I liked him to I liked him to win that match. I liked him to dominate from the baseline just like Novak did. Uh, I liked him to um, equalize in the serve return dynamic um, if you know or sorry, get a lot of returns in play just like Novak did, I should say. And um, I picked my prediction was this. 
I said Nadal in four or he retires. I literally said that in the prediction. And the reason I said or he retires is because there have been many occasions where Rafa has refused to retire out of respect for his opponent. 2011 Ferrer Australian Open, uh, Australian Open final in 17 against Vavrinka. That's another example. These were moments where Rafa was clearly going to lose. He was physically compromised. He he had nothing. He was basically a, a, a wounded animal. And he just didn't want to retire because he wanted to give Stan and David those moments of winning match point. Rafa doesn't care about Nick. Rafa. Rafa could care less. Rafa doesn't like Nick. So, I mean, let's be honest. Come on. They are they are diametrically opposed in terms of their philosophies of how to go about the sport and how to go about life. So I thought there was a good chance Rafa was going to give it a shot. And if things weren't going well, he was just going to retire. So that was my prediction. It was Rafa in four or Rafa retires. From Dio Brandau, uh, can you explain why Novak struggles with the drop shot sometimes? Plus, he only plays it to one side. I don't understand why a player of his quality can't learn the forehand drop shot like Nick or Alcaraz. Well, um, I'm glad you put sometimes in this comment, by the way, because I went on Mitch Michael's podcast, who uh, he he's the host of the Inside In podcast, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, and I had this whole spiel that got posted on social media about uh, how complete Novak is as a player and how you can't you can't really he doesn't have a weakness to expose essentially, and that the overhead is not an exposable weakness weakness, so that doesn't count, and how there's really nothing, and how it's it's difficult to come up with a play style that. That really bothers Novak, and it's difficult to game plan against Novak because he's so complete. And a lot of people replied on social media um, with their opinion on Novak's weaknesses. And I saw a drop shot by a few people. Without, like, unless you put a ton of nuance, that is baloney. That is bal. That is... Whew. Without the backhand drop shot that Novak possesses, he would be in a way worse place. Way worse place in the last couple of years. Now, in 2020, Djokovic had some systematic issues that he was trying to cover up with the drop shot. And it was like putting lipstick on a pig. Is that the saying? Did I get that? I may or may not have gotten that. Uh, it was like, it's like putting a bandaid on a, uh, on a four inch, uh, flesh wound. Okay. Not going to work. Novak just wasn't, he didn't have enough baseline power. The forehand wasn't working. His shot tolerance wasn't great in 2020, uh, either. And as a result, this is post pandemic, by the way, I want to clarify pre pandemic. He was fine. Uh, post pandemic. Novak, there was a lot of issues with his game, and he just couldn't find a finish. So he was like, crap, I just got a drop shot. That's that's how I'm going to try to finish. Drop shot, drop shot, drop shot. Did it get him into deep trouble against Nadal, who game planned for the drop shot, is exceptional at covering the drop shot? Yes, it did. All those things are true. Uh, does it get him into trouble sometimes when he's super desperate and tired and out of answers? Yeah, sometimes. But... In 98% of his matches, Novak's drop shot helps him in a big way. One of the most important uh, points of the match against Nick was a was a drop shot winner. Um, Djokovic's backhand drop shot, the execution on it is phenomenal. Generally speaking, after 2020, the shot selection on it is really, really good. And it is like... Literally a top 10 backhand drop shot in the sport. And people had the audacity to say it's a weakness. I thought that was nuts. I thought that was crazy. I couldn't believe what I was reading. It's not a weakness. Uh, this commenter, uh, Dio here, uh, points out, correctly so, that he doesn't have it on the forehand. Look, it's just harder. Most players don't. 
it's it's a more difficult drop shot. It might have something to do with his high take back. I don't know. Alcaraz's take back is high as well, so I'm not sure if that's an excuse. Uh, it might have something to do with the fact that he feels that it's less necessary to develop on the forehand. Maybe we'll see that um, as the years go on with Novak. Maybe he will get a better forehand drop shot. Uh, maybe he just doesn't, because he doesn't hit a slice on his forehand, he just doesn't really feel that shot as well. There are a lot of reasons, but all I'll say about Novak not having a great forehand drop shot is that is very typical. The majority of players on tour uh, hit their drop shot much better on their backhand than they do their forehand. And uh, part of that, I think, is, is yeah, the repetition on the backhand slice and just having a, a better feel for that for some reason. And and also, you mentioned that it play, only plays it to one side. I think you mean that's on the backhand, but if you mean that he goes down the line, that's generally where you want to hit the, the drop shot. You don't want to go cross-court very often. There are few exceptions to that. Uh, this one is from Martin. Uh, would Rafael Nadal have reached less than 14 French Open titles if the underarm serve had been a common thing among ATP players earlier in time, if it had been a no-go before 2020? Wait, oh, it had been a no-go before 2020. Now it will continue growing. More and more players will use it and feel less ashamed. No, hard disagree on this. Like, hard, hard veto, red card disagree. First of all, how is it growing? Who's using it more and more? I can watch 10 matches tomorrow. I will call on T2. I will call six matches tomorrow. And I will not see an underarm surf. So what's going on here? It's accepted. Like that's what I think we need to wrap our brains around. There is no one taking an issue with underarm serves anymore. It is completely accepted. Everybody has gotten over the really stupid notion that it's bad sportsmanship to do it. Stupid notion because it's fine sportsmanship. Guess what? It's not bad sportsmanship. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Especially, look, uh, Al uh, Sasha Bublik. He uses it all the time, Alexander Bublik. Do you know what percent of first serve points Bublik wins on the season? It's got to be like, I don't have the number here, but let's say conservatively between 70 and 80%. How, what percent of underarm serve points does he win? You think it's over 50? Maybe it's about 50. That's super crappy. Super, super, super crappy. Mathematically bad, dumb, silly. And we talk about the reasons. You Your court position isn't very good because you're behind the baseline. Your disguise isn't very good because it looks nothing like an overhead serve. And your opponent is in a ready position with their balance centered in, in an explosive position ready to dart forward if need be or side to side. So there are all of these factors that work against the underarm serve. I'm telling you, like, keep track of how often it works. If it was a real advantage, if it worked... Players would use it. Players would use it. Nick would do it. 20 times a match if it worked. Bublik would do it. 20 times a match if it worked. Guess what? They do it once. They do it twice. They do it maybe three times. Why? Because it doesn't work. They, they just like to throw it in there as a mental curveball as a change-up, as a crowd-pleaser, to give themselves some energy. It doesn't work. Underarm serves are terrible, terribly ineffective, terribly ineffective. So no, Nadal would still have 14 French Opens. Hi, Gil. What in particular do you think Alcaraz has to improve to be able to win matches when not on full confidence? It feels like his level has dropped a bit in terms of shot consistency and pace absorption. Uh, as it is normal and unavoidable to have fluctuations in form, how can Carlos improve uh, with patterns, strategies, etc. to win more easily while in second gear? 
I mean, the easy answer to that question is he needs to find a way to 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 rein in his targets a little bit, mostly on the forehand, also on the backhand. You know, just have a different, have a plan B, have a different way of playing where you're just you're playing a little bit safer and and you're you're limiting the errors at all costs because again this is what i've been saying with with alcaraz like you look at i don't know exactly if he's fully modeling his game around federer who who tends to just go after things no matter what but like if if you look at nadal and djokovic certainly even on their bad days they're not going to make buckets of errors and hand you an easy win on their worst matches, they're not going to do that. They're still going to make you earn it. They're still going to put the ball on the court. And Alcaraz needs to get to the point, especially with his speed, where he's never making as many errors as as he has, especially on the forehand in some of these matches. Um, I do want to say, though, maybe the uh, the words escaping me here. The context of that question is unfair. Like, has Alcaraz really dipped in form? He lost to Sinner playing the best match of his life on a surface Alcaraz has no experience on. I know Sinner's experience was lacking too, but look, I've, I've broken down that match and, and why I don't uh, read much into it. Then he lost to Zverev who played an excellent match at Roland Garros, like, let's maybe let him take a loss that is a little more concerning than that before we uh, start to existentially evaluate what he needs to change in his game to avoid. Uh, I don't know. It just felt like the question was... It felt like a question that would be asked of a player who's taken some bad losses, where Carlos hasn't. Let's be real. Carlos hasn't taken some bad losses. And he almost came back against Verev. He almost sent that to a fifth set, you know? So not only has he not... He got beaten pretty handedly by Sinner, but not Zverev. Point, point being, n neither of the losses were that bad. From... I'm not even going to try. How bad is it to lose a match like Fritz did against Rafa? What do you expect of him? in the upcoming North American swing. Yeah, there have just been a lot of matches that have gotten away from Fritz, but overall, he's got a good attitude about it, and he's improving really fast. Excuse me. Um, he is... Uh, I believe he's been playing at a top 10 level all year long. I said that in January during the Australian Open. A lot of people said that I'm being biased as an American. Those people who said that can kick rocks... He's top 10 in the race. He's proven me correct. I don't care that much if a player is American. I do want, I do like Americans to do well because I want the sport to grow in this country. So I'm not going to say I don't care at all how Americans do, but I can certainly freaking evaluate them objectively. And uh, yeah, Fritz has been awesome all year. Mentally, when it comes to closing, when it comes to just finding a way to win, there have been uh, a lot of matches that I think Fritz has uh, been uh, left a lot to be desired in terms of the result. Djokovic in Australia, 2021. Tsitsipas in Australia this year, 2022. I felt Fritz was the better player in that match and uh, just got tight at the end of every set and ended up losing it because of that. And then here at Wimbledon. Uh, with that being said, usually in this kind of scenario, at a certain point, there's a breakthrough. At a certain point, it clicks. I don't find it any different from Felix losing a bunch of finals. Fritz is a young player who keeps getting better and keeps putting himself in these positions. At a certain point, it'll happen for him. So uh, long term, I think he's fine. And in terms of the North American hardcourt swing, I think he'll have a big one and a successful one. From Andre, hi Gil, love your content, thank you. Uh, what is your opinion on the fact that you can technically be number one, being exceptional only on hard courts? See Daniil Medvedev. I know this is a question of scheduling, having uh, having two slams and six masters on hard, but don't you think that this is unfair? I never know how to answer these questions because who are we mad at? 
it, it feels like old man yells at cloud. The fact that there are more hard courts in the world than clay courts and grass courts, isn't that a product of just like what local venues go with and how easy slash hard it is for these venues to, to, uh, maintain these courts? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know, I guess is the answer. Forget what I just said. Scratch what I just said because I, I'm, I don't know anything about this, but uh, it's been this way for a while, and I just, the idea of it changing seems so, so unrealistic. I do think Hamburg is going to become a grass court masters, and I think it'll be before Wimbledon. So I do think that'll happen, and there's going to be another grass court tournament and one less clay, but man, like, in order for us to, for this to be worth our, our, are while in discussing we need to have a, a better idea of why this is or, or maybe the fact of how it could change but do i think it's unfair yeah does it do, is everything here fair like can we possibly create a world where like everything's perfect and there's complete fairness for all players of all kinds not really so i'm not losing sleep about it it just it feels like the kind of thing that pretty much needs to just be accepted. And at least hardcourt is the middle ground surface, right? You know, clay has a certain a certain way to it uh, in terms of how slow it can be. Where uh, and and ha some hardcourts can be as slow as clay courts, but clay has a court speed that is on the extreme end. Grass is on the extreme end of offense at the very least, even if it's not just speed, offense, difficult to move, low bounce, relatively fast. So grass is on the high end of offense. At least hard court is your middle ground. And that's another reason why it just doesn't, this just doesn't upset me very much. Maybe it should, maybe I'm wrong. Just telling you how I feel. From Max Dang Vu, Gil, thanks for the awesome Wimbledon coverage. Appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to the American hardcourts. Two matchups I really want to see is Medvedev versus Alcaraz and Fritz versus FAA. How do you see both matchups play out on these hardcourt surfaces? I think Medvedev is the ultimate test for Alcaraz. He attacks Alcaraz in the two ways where Carlos might be vulnerable. Serve return dynamic, out right, uh, out serving Carlos, potentially. That's the one area. And then um, Medvedev really tests your consistency. You have to be patient. A lot of extra balls to come back. A lot of depth in rally. You know, same thing could be said for like a Djokovic. And to me, that's the ultimate test of Alcaraz. Fritz versus FAA. Very close. You know, they do a lot of the same things well. Uh, I think... They they are uh, at this point very similar players right now, and um, I don't see that as a matchup that uh, where there's a clear direction of of how that goes. I think that could go either way. Uh, I I like FAA backhand and backhand. Sorry, sorry, misspoke. I like Fritz. Uh, I like Fritz's backhand a lot better than I like Felix's backhand. The only I guess the the biggest thing that I like Felix in is um, the movement and the athleticism. But if I did a uh, an attribute analysis, Felix to Fritz, they'd come out pretty close right now. They really would. From Leon, do you think uh, the four matches that Djokovic and Federer played were both during their prime and what aspects of their game make them so great on grass. In other words, why do they have such so much success on grass, uh, so much more success on grass than others when their strengths are so different? The second part of that question is really good. Think about it like this. If you have a pie chart of rally length, of course I'm oversimplifying, right? But if you have a pie chart of rally length, uh, think about grass as being the surface where the larger slice of the pie is going to be short zero through four ball rallies. And it's a grass becomes more about winning those. That becomes more important. 
Well, Djokovic and Federer are both exceptional in those areas for different reasons. And that's why that's why you have the same result, which is they're great on grass, but the styles are different because they're different. For Federer, it is the violent offensive barrage in the zero through four shot rally lengths, both on serve and then sometimes with the aggression on return and uh, what, what he can do, especially on the second serve return. But for Federer, it is early instant offense, the best we've ever seen outside of the serve volley era, right? Best we've ever seen, early aggression. Serve plus one, all that good stuff. Djokovic, the best we've ever seen at surviving the early aggression, neutralizing the zero plus, uh, the, the zero through four shot rally lengths. Whether it be a Berrettini or a Nick Kyrgios, the best serves, the best forehands in the world, great aggressive players. What does Novak do? He neutralizes that. That's why Federer and Djokovic are both so great on grass, despite having different styles. From SJ, I've been uh, hearing some crazy takes about team going around, so I'm wondering what your take is here. When team was in his prime around 2019 through 2020, what ballpark would you say his level of tennis was around? Would you say more in the Roddick realm? Maybe Vavrinka, Murray even? Though obviously not his consistency considering the injury. Where was he at 2020? Guys, I'm a huge, huge advocate for Team's 2020 and how well he was playing. Novak had the best year in 2020. He, he won one major, so did Team. But if you look at the other events, Novak had a better year. Um, That said, Team redlining in 2020 was the best player in the world. I um I would say Murray of of that look yeah I would say he was about as good as prime Andy Murray for one year there um it reminded me kind of of a 2015 or 2016 level no it wasn't cuz he didn't nearly have that consistency um I don't know team's tough because again I found him to be Pretty unplayable slash unstoppable in 2020 when he was at his best. I, I did. I, I just did. Uh, Novak got him in the fifth set in Australia for, for numerous reasons. And, and credit Djokovic, you know, leaned on on his experience. Team had a really bad uh, backhand day. Backhand down the line just wasn't firing. He needed that shot in order to win that match towards the end there. Uh, so so some, some things happened. But... Um, Man, I'm 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 so high on him. So I don't know what what takes were you're referring to. I don't know if people are kind of bashing him and his career or accomplishments or or hyping him up too much. But generally, like I think you have to have a little bit of nuance with team. What what is his body of work? His body of work is uh, leaves a lot to be desired in a lot of areas when you compare it to Andy Roddick or an Andy Murray, even Stan. But if you isolate one year and the level of tennis that he brought to that, unfortunately, interrupted year, 2020, um, and, and then even 2019 where he was pretty awesome as well. If you isolate that, he was one of the, the most explosive and unplayable players I have ever seen at times. So I think both of those things are true. All right, let's end it on here. This has been a Dominic Team-centric mailbag. There are a lot of good questions that I didn't get to here. Uh, maybe I'll go back and and uh, give them a, a love so that you know to ask them again. Uh, but let's end on, on another team question because there have been so many here, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, this one's from Thomas. Hey, Gil, can you please just very quickly remind us, tennis fans who do not watch tennis so regularly, what happened to Dominic Team after his triumph at the U.S. Open in 2020, and what does he now need... To to do to come back well he lost to Diego Schwartzman at the Roland Garros held in October in 2020 then he uh, I forget what he did at the year-end championships I forget what happened there uh, but beginning 2021 things were downhill and he started talking about his motivation 
started talking about how he can't seem to bring the same fire to his training. His fitness didn't seem as good. His explosiveness didn't seem as good. His focus didn't seem as good. And uh, he really didn't play that well in 2021 for the most part. It was a, it was a big dip. Uh, he did win that epic five-setter against Kyrgios at the Australian Open. And then he just went absolute dud after that. I think he lost to Dimitrov. And he went on a four-match losing streak during clay court season, which was really strange. He lost to Pablo Wanderhaar first round at Roland Garros, so then he got injured against Adrian Manorino. Then he was going to come back. At the time, I thought it was going to be a positive for team. I'm like, look, he got a little wrist injury. You know what? The guy mentally, he needed a break. He looked burnt out. He, you know, I think this is going to be a good thing for Dominic team. That was my take at the time. And he was like, hey, I'm going to go defend my title at the U.S. Open. Let's do it. I'll be back. He had a splint on it. Oops. He had a splint on his wrist for a while. And then, like three or so weeks before the U.S. Open, splint is off the wrist. Let's go. Dominic Team, defending champion. He's going to come back. He's going to play. He re-injures his wrist. And shuts it down for 2021. Then he sets a date to come back in 2022. And he just keeps having to push back that date over and over and over and over again um, until he finally comes back, lost his first seven matches, finally won a challenger, and then last week uh, won two tour-level matches in Bostad. So that's that. It's been a crazy road. I, uh, I'll end on this. Really appreciated and continue to appreciate the way... Dominic Team has gone about communicating with his fans and the media, for what it's worth, but mostly his fans matter more, um, about what he has been going through throughout this journey. Tennis players, let the fans in. Let them care about your journey. Be transparent. Provide access. That is how to get people to care about you. That is how to build fans. And I love that Dominic Team in the darkest, most, most difficult moments decided as hard as this is, I am going to bring my fans along for the ride and I'm going to tell them what's going on at every step of the way using the power of, of social media and if not giving candid interviews and just being, uh, being available in that way. So I really admired how he's done that that'll do it i'm gonna take uh some time off need to rest um so not sure when the next content will be but once we get to full speed in the uh north american hardcore swing i will uh i will be back to full speed but uh i will warn that there's going to be a, a little bit of a break in the action here and uh maybe i'll i'll do another mailbag soon but it's going to be a little bit lighter uh, for the most part. Appreciate everybody. Thanks for following along throughout all my Wimbledon coverage, which this basically concludes it. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.